So now, really, this is kind of the start of space law, right? Because, I mean, pre 1957, there's nothing in space. People had started talking about yeah. it for even decades earlier, but no one had really worked yeah. anything out. But then when uh, Sputnik 1 was launched in 1957, uh, it, it was changed. going over every country on Earth. That's right. Or nearly, it was a 60 degree inclination orbit, so pretty much every country on Earth yeah. had had Sputnik 1 going over it during its lifespan. And then these issues became really important. Yes. And people were thinking, should we be treating space like the sea? Yep. Anyone can go there. Or should it be treated like the air? No, we've got our private zone. Mm. As we've seen, that's not very practical. That's right. But just because it's not practical doesn't mean it can't be the law. There are plenty, <laughs> plenty <laughs> of never practical stopped laws. It. That's right. Never stopped a lawyer before. So uh, what's going on here? And so, so everyone started thinking about this. Uh, when Spider-Man One was launched, some Americans were thinking, they've got over the United States. This is violating our sovereignty. Maybe yeah. we should say that you can't go over, which would have made all orbital travel impossible. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But in fact, the US president at the time, Eisenhower, actually quite liked this because if you could send spacecraft over anywhere in the world, that would benefit all the countries, but it's going to benefit the democracies more because it's much e it's very easy to spy on the United States of America. Yeah. I mean, you can just read the newspapers. Yeah. It's very hard to spy on like North Korea or the USSR as it was back then, a, a authoritarian police state. But if so everyone's fact, allowed to transfer over, they get the same benefits as a Western democracy, but they get a better benefit of being able to see what's yes. going in. So he was actually quite mm -hmm. happy the Russians had done this first, because if the Americans had done it first, maybe the Russians would have objected big time. That's right. Because they'd done it first, it was hard for them to object. And they, they can't kind of say you can't come over the US or Australia, because you're already going over the US and Australia. And of course, there was a practical issue that no one could stop these spacecraft. Yep. That's true. So, I mean, why ban something you can't do anything about? Uh, but in fact, over the next few years, the USA and USSR yep. were most worried about something yes. like this. This was the period of the Cold War. Yeah. Uh, and what happens if there are vast numbers of nuclear weapons orbiting in space? And look, it, it's not a dramatic extinction to think if we could put something in space, we could put a nuclear bomb in space. And there were plans that were talked about that involve that. So they decided that they were, before everyone started putting yeah. huge numbers of nukes in space, was the right time to ban it. Yes. Once they were already up there, it was going to be hard to ban. So the USA and USSR both had a common agreement in yeah. not having to spend billions of dollars putting huge numbers of nuclear weapons into space. Yeah, I actually think that's almost an achievement. Like, they were so early and they solved the problem ahead of time, they said, let's just stop it from becoming a reality. And this is often seen as the first yeah. great effective arms control treaty. Yeah. Um, so committees were set up, a committee on the peaceful uses of outer space, COPUOS. Which and, still goes today. Under the jurisdiction of the United Nations. And so the USA and USSR wanted not clouds of nukes in space. But by this point in the 60s, you start having many other countries. You know, Ten years earlier, it would have only been the British colonial empire, a few other, there were only yeah. a small number of countries on Earth. Oh, but this is, yes, post-World War II, so... All the colonies have yes. been set, liberated, so now there are large numbers of African countries. And all these yeah. new developing countries, yeah. what they wanted, they didn't care about the nuclear weapons in space, they weren't going to launch any, no yeah. one's going to launch it against them. What they wanted was to stop USA and USSR appropriating all of space before they get a chance to get there. Yeah, essentially they see, hey, here's a new realm of colonization, let's actually stop it before we repeat the issues on Earth. And of course these mm. countries had the majority of the votes in the UN, yeah. there are a lot more of them. That's right. So they had to work with those countries on what they wanted. And so eventually, after a whole bunch of memoranda and conventions, they came up with the founding document yes. of international space law, the Outer Space Treaty. Yeah. When, when I was one year old, and you were minus quite a bit, I Yeah, imagine. minus quite a bit, but that's all right. Um, and it said that outer space, including the moon, shall be free for expression use by all states yeah. without discrimination on the basis of equality. So, okay, so let's tell it, you. It's really saying that everywhere in space, Everyone gets a fair go, right? So it's going to be like the sea and yeah. not like the air. Yep. Okay. So it's a good fundamental point. Yeah. And then the uh, uh, USA and USSR got what they wanted. No one's allowed to put nuclear weapons or other kinds of mass destruction in Which, space. And again, this is still binding when we talk about what's happening on the moon and stuff like that. Everyone points to, you can't deploy these weapons. Now, it didn't ban weapons in space. That's right. It banned the testing of weapons yes. in space. Um, this is where it gets complicated. And also because in the previous thing it said it could call it international law, and there is an international law saying you've got a right to self-defense. And this is where it becomes grey. Yes. Yes. Well, um, and then the developing countries got what they wanted. Yeah. This is a quid pro quo for them supporting everything else. And it said that it should be carried out, expression of space for the benefit, and in the interests of all countries, 
irrespective of their degree of scientific yeah. or economic development, and shall be the province of all mankind. Yes. As we'll come back to, what the hell does that mean, the province yeah. of all mankind? It was deliberately vague yes. because it could mean whatever anyone wanted to anybody and therefore everyone signed up to it. Yes. And this is how these international treaties often work. You yeah. come up with blurry words to push the disagreement. As they say, it's cost. clear and it's unclarity. And, and this is kind of one of the issues that people point to, right? Mm. And it said that outer space, including the moon, other celestial yeah. bodies, is not subject yes. to national appropriation by claim of sovereignty. So, so, so that planting of the American flag doesn't allow Americans to claim it. Yes. So that's very clear. You can't yeah. claim it. So anyone can go through it. No one can claim it. And you've you got can... to do it for the benefit of all countries, whatever that means. Yeah. Um, and there was also some more formal stuff. For example, there were rules saying that if an American astronaut lands in Russia, you have to give him back. Yes. And uh, all spacecraft added to United Nations registry by the country that launches and owns them. Which still happens today. Yep. They're often very delayed. Yes. Um, and that country is then responsible for it legally. Yes. So this tells you what happens if you murder another astronaut. So, so this is kind of the flagging of ships as you were talking about almost, yes. right? This is the same for the sea. Yes. So if you're on an American registered cruise liner and you murder another per guest, you're an... it, American law will apply. So if you're on a Russian or a, let's say you're on a Chinese yep. um, space station and you murder another astronaut, then Chinese, Chinese law, law will apply. Yep. Um, and that actually turns out even if the spacecraft was launched by a private company against the wishes. So Which for example, happened, let's yes. say Elon Musk launches a rocket despite being told not to, the US is still liable for anything that's that happens right. to it. And, and this actually becomes quite critical, I think, in the kind of modern day discussions about that private interaction with national oversight. That's right. And this has been widely yeah. ratified. Um, all the major space powers have signed this yes. and over 110 other countries. This means that even the countries that haven't signed it or a country that pulls out are still probably bound by it. This is what's called yeah. customary international law. And, and this is a, a, an earth law concept, right? Yes, it's an international earth law concept that if something is widely obeyed by lots of countries, that even if they haven't signed it, they're still bound by it to some extent. This has not been tested in the courts. That's right. Uh, may or may not be true, but th that's the general idea. And, and I think for the most part, as you pointed out, the countries that even haven't necessarily ratified that when they launch their things, they still register their spacecraft and follow the other things. So they're still following the treaties anyways, for the most part. I think any country that was about to launch something would probably sign this anyway. Yeah, exactly. And there have been a following up treaties that clarified some of the rules and are also widely signed. As you said, like the, the rescue and return, which again, this is really coming from um, the, the law of the seas of if someone's in distress, you have a duty to rescue them, but also you can't claim ownership of their ship or themselves.